I'm Margaret Christie. I'm the Special Projects Director at CISA, and I am also on the PV Grows Steering Committee. And I want to remind you, what we're going to do next is do a case study of farm to institution relationships here at UMass. And then we're going to do have um, eight or nine additional examples, and we're going to break into groups and have an opportunity to talk directly to people who are participating in those other enterprises. So UMass is hosting us today. They do a great job with farm to institutions. They have a lot of um, good experience to share with us. And so we have a panel of people who have been involved with um, farm to institution at UMass. So you saw Kelly had a slide um, that showed all the different facets of farm to institution. And what we're going to do when we introduce each additional project or enterprise or organization is show you the slide from their perspective that shows the pieces and how they fit together. So you'll be able to see how it's different for each of these groups. Um, and UMass, as I said, has a lot of experience with this. They've really figured out systems that work for them. And so I want to encourage our panelists to talk about how was it at the beginning? Because I think using Kelly's um, Match.com analogy, one of the things <laughs> that's true in farm institution sales is that Institutions have a system for how they get their food, and it works for them. They've done it for a long time. They know how to do it. People come in in the morning, and they know what they're supposed to do. And so if you're trying to create a new system, that's hard. But once that system is up and running, kind of like once you find your perfect match on Match.com, mostly, like, you're doing OK. Maybe every once in a while, you need a little couples therapy. But most of the time, you have your systems in place, and you know how to make it work. So I want to encourage the panelists to tell us a little bit about what were the channel challenges early on? What new systems did they have to develop? How did they figure out how to overcome those obstacles? So each panelist has eight minutes. We have a timekeeper who's going to tell you when you're halfway through. Um, and we have here a farmer. We have somebody from UMass Dining Services. We have a UMass student. And then we have somebody who knows a lot about policy that affects farm to institution sales. So I'm going to let each person introduce themselves, but I'm going to start um, with Joe Sikowski, who's at Joe Sikowski Farms. I have heard the UMass Dining Services people say that they can see Joe's fields from campus, and if you can see him from anywhere, I would think you could see him from here. So Joe, you can tell us if that's true. Um, and you can stand up, point, talk, let's see if we can make this. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I'm Joe Sikowski. I run Joe Sikowski Farm in Lakeside Organics at Hadley. We farm about 400 acres in Hadley and the surrounding towns. Uh, my family has always farmed, uh, period. That's all we've ever done. Um, to say something interesting about our farm, uh, in 2010, the United Nations came out with a watch list of most endangered locations. And that included the, the number 83 on the list was the, the cultural landscapes of Hadley, which is the land around the original stockade. And that's number 83 on the UN Worldwide Watch List of Most Endangered Locations from uh, Development Pressure. And that's, that's kind of neat. And uh, we've recently preserved that for, uh, with the uh, Mass Viability pro uh, Program to protect that from future development. Um, we, we, work, we have some wonderful resources. Our land is great. Our, our climate is, is very good. We're also in a great area to sell things. And UMass is a city right at our doorstep. And UMass has been great to work with. Ken and, and Chris and Evelyn and Wayne and, and, and Dave have, have been supportive of this right from the start. We started supplying the top of the campus restaurant about 10 years ago. Um, and it was just Mickey Mouse amounts of stuff, like uh, seven bags of peeled squash or something. But then uh, when Ken came to UMass, he took a real interest in trying to get local products into the college. And uh, it's grown every year. I think sales now are about 300000 a year. And that's, that's a big help. That helps uh, keep the money in the local community. It helps preserve open space. It helps provide a better and fresher fruits and vegetables for the students. Um, it, it helps a lot of people. And uh, in a world where people don't really appreciate it, the farmers truly do. Um, it's, it's been a big help, especially at a time when the tobacco business is, uh, has fallen off significantly. And I, I think this has made a difference because it kept some of the farmland as farmland because there was a market for 
products that they could grow once the tobacco business uh, was was decimated. Um, it's it's worked well. UMass takes the time and trouble and effort to separate out the local items in each order they place. They place three three orders a week for each dining hall, and then some of the food services like catering and other the, the restaurant. We we deliver three times a week. We also take a lot of calls while we're loading the truck. We're we're usually getting calls from the dining halls of things they're short on or things they want added, which is nice because we're only a mile and a half away, so it works. There comes a cutoff point where we have to stop taking the calls for add-ons, otherwise the truck will never leave. <laughs> um, we have good vegetables and fruit. We also are HACCPs and GAP and GMP certified. We also carry all the proper insurances to sell to the colleges and to any institution. And I think that makes a difference. We send samples to Northeast Labs to make sure our cutting boards and other equipment are safe and clean. I don't know too many other farms or purveyors in the area who, who, who do that, but I, I think it's necessary to be responsible to provide safe food for anybody. If, if ever there was a problem, it would be, it, it would be sad for a lot of reasons. So we, we try to avoid that and try to keep things nice. We've recently built a new facility um, they're working on the electrical today, and we should be in it within another two weeks. And it's going to—it's all that's already HACCP and GAP certified, so we can we can ship from there. UMass has been supportive more than anybody else. They've led the way, and it also makes it possible to help others because when we're pulling products together, when we're pulling products together for for UMass, it makes sense to pull products together for the other local schools like Chicopee or Amherst or the nursery schools or the preschool programs or the hospitals because we're out running around getting the stuff anyhow. So it's kind of like an anchor store at a mall. Now it's worth going. And so we do, and it, it, it helps others like the nursery schools and the others that probably wouldn't justify uh, serving because they have really little bellies and they don't <laughs> eat that much. <laughs> if, 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 I said, if I were to say we have one weakness, it would be that our, our bookkeeping can be lax. That's something I've, I've learned about in the last few years. That's probably our weakest problem. Um, I see, I'm a farmer at heart, and I see paperwork is just an awful waste product of farming. <laughs> but we, we have a new bookkeeper, and we're working on that. And that's, that's something that I think every farmer starting out might want to take a look at before they, uh, they make so many mistakes. <laughs> um, which are expensive because you can lose a lot of money in the office if you're you can be a good farmer and love what you do but uh, that's important and now we're working with Florence and some of the other people at UMass to make sure our bookkeeping is is, is better I don't know where all the invoices go um, but we're working on correcting that problem and I think we're making some good progress <laughs> um, I think the future looks bright with UMass they, they've been great on adding new items every year. We sit down with Chris or Ken every winter and go over with, with seed catalogs and go over what they might like or what they might like to try. It's, it's been nice. It's been very nice. And uh, once again, I, I thank them for their support. I, I would like to bring up another uh, topic, and that's a, a, a problem a lot of farmers are having, and I'd like your, your support with this. The Department of Labor came out last summer, and they did five-day audits at a lot of farms. And they, they whipped out this law from 1939, and they're, they're catching so many farmers on it and just charging them overwhelming uh, penalties. And the law that they, they caught the farmers on was that the farmers were touching other people's products. In other words, if I bought an apple or a potato from another farm, um, they would take away your ag exemptions retroactively for three years. And on my particular farm, they, uh, they, they asked for $130,000. Um, and it's not just me, other farmers are getting whacked left and right. I got a call from Bill Shore, who has an apple orchard, and he made ice cider. And because he, made, he added value to his farm products, they asked him for $85,100 um, because they said it's not an agricultural product, it's a manufactured product. Um, and this is going on all over the country, and they opened up an office in, in Western Mass um, recently. And I'm concerned because it's going to make the farm-to-school program very difficult to work with. So I would, 
ask you um, to take seriously writing an uh, email to Senator Cowan. And the reason why he's important is he's on the farm, he's writing the farm bill now with other senators. So they might be able to do something to make it better in the future. And I think it's very, very important. So please write Senator Cowan and tell him that uh, you support the farmers being able to work with others. Just because they can't work together in Congress should, shouldn't mean that, that farmers can't work together. And also the Department of Labor has a responsibility to come out and say what their definition of agriculture is because their definition of agriculture is unlike anybody else's. Um, and I, I think they were remiss in, in not, not getting that communicated earlier. But they've never come out like they have recently. And uh, I really would ask that you take the time and just write a short email. And thank you again. Say that again? Is there a section or something where you refer to that Just write, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, we'll see if we can send an email with that information and then people can act on it. Yeah, it's just farmers' difficulties with DOL. I don't know if there's a, a scroll down for that, but there should be. <laughs> I'd like to say something else about that, too, which is that the regional administrator for the um, USDA Food and Nutrition Service, which is the overseer of school meals, is personally investigating this and learning about it and wanting his department in USDA to kind of go beat on labor and say you're keeping us from doing our job. So if any of you are in school food service and would like to communicate with that regional administrator to tell them how important that would be to you, or if you can go to your school food service person and say, do you know this is happening, can you communicate? His name is James Arena De Rosa, and it's the USDA Food and Nutrition Service. So we can maybe add that to Margaret's email. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Sam um, said earlier that when we were planning this session, we knew that we really needed to make sure that Kelly Irwin could be here, and the other person that we really wanted to make sure could be here was Joe. So we're really glad that the date and everything all worked out, and thanks a lot. The next person that I want to introduce is Chris Howland, who's here at UMass Dining Services. So he'll show, he'll talk a little bit. For those of you who are imagining being a food service professional, here's a food service professional. How's everyone doing? Can everyone hear me in the back? All right, excellent. Uh, well, like uh, I was introduced, my name is Chris, and I work at UMass. Uh, I've been here for over 10 years uh, in various capacities, uh, but right now I oversee purchasing and marketing for auxiliary enterprises. And uh, we oversee the dining commons, uh, catering, uh, the hotel, um, you know, where you're sitting right now. Um, so like, like Joe said, we've had a, a fairly long relationship. Um, started a little bit before my time. Um, but uh, you know, I can tell you right now that it's it's you know it's, it's working very 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 smoothly. Um, you know, Joe is very humble when he says that there's a cutoff. There's really no cutoff. Um, you know, you know they could be at the dock and say we need more potatoes to go back. I mean, it's really that that easy to do. Um, so it's really made our our jobs easy. Um, another thing that that's made it happen is the insurance. Um, obviously, smaller farms really can't afford the insurance um, that UMass requires to uh, the liability insurance to 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 serve UMass, uh, Joe takes that uh, worry away. He covers en en enough insurance, so if there's a smaller smaller farmer uh, that, that can't do business with us, Joe buys the product from the smaller farmer, uh, and then we can basically use their product, which kind of makes the, the the topic that Joe just mentioned even more important because um, you know he's he's getting whacked for doing us a favor. Um, so if you if you can help, you know, write letters, do what, do whatever you can because. The farmer shouldn't be penalized for this. You know, it's it's just really ridiculous. Um, so anyway, so so Joe is one way that we that we get local produce, uh, value-added products to campus uh, to the tune of about three hundred thousand uh, dollars. There's definitely a lot more that we can do. Uh, obviously, there's a short growing season. Um, you know, UMass is in session from September to May, and there's not always uh, enough enough product available. Uh, so one of the things that we're, that we're trying to work on, and uh, Jody didn't mention this, but to extend the growing season. Uh, so that basically means for, you know, freezing product and using them during, during the winter months. Uh, this is you know, very early stages, but this is something that, that we want to try uh, for this fall and see how it works. Um, so like broccoli, uh, carrots, uh, maybe even some fruits, uh, strawberries, blueberries. Uh, Joe mentioned that he can work with, he has a, an IQF process, um, which, is, which is pretty good up until now. We just freeze, we've, we've frozen just you know, berries, but they're just one giant block, so you can't really use them too much except for sauces. 
Um, but that, that's been working out. So we're going to be working on that to try to extend the growing season. Uh, and just, you know, I, and, you know, buy more and more. You know, we're growing left and right UMass Dining. Uh, we serve right now about 16,500 students on the meal plan, 40,000 meals a day. That's a lot of produce. Uh, next year, we're going probably around to 17,500 students. Um, so that's even more produce. So, you know, we have a, a lot to, you know, look forward to with Joe. Uh, the second way that we get produce is from our prime vendor, Fresh Point, um, and they're, they're located in Hartford, Connecticut, and we've, we probably spend around $2.1, $2.2 million with them, um, and that's generally because, you know, they, they offer produce year-round, uh, but they also have an excellent um, local farmers program, and we spend about $300,000 with them to source uh, regional um, fruits and vegetables as well. Um, so uh, we do about six hundred thousand dollars total uh, annually, which is I think is a pretty pretty good step. But I think you know, like Ken Toom always says, we can we can do better, and I think we, I think you know there's there's room to grow. Um, so you know, working with Joe, I you know we're always uh, you know trying to come up with different ways to increase the uh, the local local spend, whether that's you know value added products. He makes a great marinara sauce. He's working some butternut oil, uh, you know the IQF products. Um, so there's a lot lot there. Uh, the third way is with the student uh, student run farm, which is actually a great product pro uh, program. I'm not sure if anyone here is aware of it, um, but it's actually a, a fully functioning farm. Um, it's like a class on the UMass campus um, where students learn how to grow, plant, you know, um, develop their crops, and also the most important part, which Joe doesn't like, uh, uh, collecting payment, making sure that things are paid on time. Um, but you know, like Joe said, that's 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 very important because uh, without Getting the money into your farm, um, you know your farm's not going to not going to run, and that's actually another kind of area um, that that we could be approved upon. Um, you know, farmers like the farm; they don't like to you know do paperwork. Uh, paying farmers, um, especially smaller farmers, um, is really difficult sometimes because you know usually when we call, um, they can't accept credit cards. Um, you know, PayPal probably isn't you know in their vocabulary. Um, and it's hard to kind of reach them because they're generally farming. Um, so I'm, you know, I think that that can be worked on. I don't know if there are, there are classes um, that could be offered. Um, you know, you know, the kind of the, the back end part of farming, how to improve your relationships. Um, but I think that that would definitely grow business um, if you make it easier to pay um, other than cash. Um, I think that would that would definitely that would definitely help. Um, and then uh, another way we get produce is from our permaculture garden. I'm not sure if anyone is uh, familiar with that. Um, that's basically re you know, regeneration, regenerating the land uh, through using uh, different types of uh, plants and vegetables um, to refortify the, the earth. Um, so we, we have a large permaculture garden over in Franklin Dining Commons. If you have a chance, I'd you know, love you to go check it out. Uh, we have a small herb garden in Worcester, and we also have a permaculture garden over in Berkshire. And this is uh, exciting news. We're we're, do, we're um, working with the chancellor's office, um, so the chancellor's going to have their very own permaculture garden at the chancellor's house. So, you know, we're just growing. It's great. Um, it's, it's, and we're able to use some of that that product uh, back in the dining commons. Um, and then the last, lastly, we're working with a company that that grows lettuce hydroponically right on campus. Um, so we're going to be we're, we've been uh, working with them last uh, six months, um, and uh, they're not very good on invoicing either. So. Uh, I, actually, I actually have a meeting with them uh, later this week to kind of go over the finances, um, but they have been pretty, you know, sort, they haven't given us product, they just haven't been paid yet, so we're, we're working, on, working on that. But that's a, it's a great facility, it's uh, right by the new greenhouses, if you ever have a, a chance, you know, let me know, we, we can go down there and, and take a look, it's a really cool system. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think uh, my time's up, but if you have any questions, I'll be right here um, and I can help you out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris. We will have time for questions at the end, um, so just write them down. Um, the next person I want to introduce is Joanna Benoit. Joanna is a student here at UMass, and of course, particularly, I, of course, anytime you're dealing with schools, students are a piece of the puzzle. Um, and as they get older, they've got more and more opinions and ways to voice them. So it's great that <laughs> Joanna's here to tell us about that perspective. Hi, yeah. so my name is Joanna. I'm a student at UMass. Um, I'm here to talk specifically more about um, the Real Food Challenge um, and kind of by telling our story, hopefully I can touch upon some of our successes, some of our challenges throughout the experience because it's been a great one. Um, me personally, I started off with the Real Food Challenge as an intern and my role kind of expanded when I started working as a sustainability coordinator with Auxiliary Services and it kind of grew from there. 
So it's a little bit of the background. Uh, the Real Food Challenge is a nationwide campaign that focuses on bringing more nourishing foods to college campuses. Um, the terms real and nourishing are kind of these broad terms indicating food that improves all stages of the food economy from producers to consumers. So at UMass, we have been determining the percentage of real food we are already sourcing by going through dining service invoices and putting the data of what we were purchasing into the campaign's calculator. Uh, the campaign's calculator has four different categories, those being ecologically sound, um, humanely raised, fair trade, and local. To be considered real food, um, that food item just has to fit into one of those categories. Um, so the challenge first came to UMass uh, when, after doing research for a class, a member of the student food advocates saw the potential for it to kind of grow and um, flourish at the UMass campus. Because UMass, as we've already heard, is incredibly progressive in ideas of sustainability with plenty of initiatives, academic programs, and cutting edge ideas and food system reform already growing. So the Real Food Challenge we saw it kind of as a way to make a statement and a dedication to ideals that were already becoming a huge part of campus life. Um, but still, it wasn't an instantaneous process, and it took a lot of legwork to get it to where it is today. Um, the goal of the commitment is to get the chancellor to sign on to 20% real food by the year 2020. We began that process by engaging um, in dialogue with faculty and staff who may already have interest in these kind of ideas and people who may be able to <coughs> open the doors to conversations with other decision makers who may help us come into agreement that this commitment and this challenge was beneficial for the campus. Um, so it was last year, about, when we started these dialogues with groups like FAIR and EPAC, which are student and faculty groups on campus um, dedicated to environmental reform. Um, also started working with dining services, because if you're trying to reform the dining services, you want to work with them. <laughs> So what we kind of saw was that the scope of the idea of real food is incredibly fast and encompasses a lot of different ideas. So there were some points of confusion considering what exactly real food was and what it meant. Um, for example, while local is a huge part of real food, um, especially in this area, um, it wasn't, it's not all it's about. It's about sourcing things that we can't grow locally, like chocolate or like coffee to be more sustainable or more ecologically sound um, or fair trade. So we had to get to the level where um, we had to learn how to address these concerns on a one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face level. Um, and as long as we had the opportunity to meet with these, meet individually, individually with these decision makers to address their concerns, we always were able to reach an understanding um, and to overcome that challenge. <coughs> So yeah, there was also another challenge, meaning to source more real food to a campus of UMass's size. There were tons of invoices to go through, even to get a baseline percentage of what our real food already was. Um, so there was obviously a need to have more people involved um, and more hands actually working on the calculator and getting this percentage figured out. And so the solution to that was the development of an internship. The internship was a two-credit internship for students who were interested in helping out. We got people from all different backgrounds, a lot of food science majors, sustainable food and farming majors, um, even like anthropology majors. People were just interested in getting involved and learning more about the campaign. So while the campaign, or the internship, did kind of start off just as calculator work and data entry and going through invoices, um, it very quickly morphed into something else. Uh, we had to learn kind of just to be flexible and just let it go with its natural flow and just go along for the ride. Um, because with all of these students coming from so many different backgrounds, they were all so interested in learning more about the food system, what we were actually looking at, and what it actually meant. Um, so once we started delving into modern food systems and what, what the information we were actually looking at meant, the students, the interns were so incredibly excited and they wanted to start spreading the word, they wanted to start just doing more outreach about what our mission was. So we did that through um, like tabling and event planning, um, just a lot of student outreach, and because of that we were able to reach a huge percentage of the human or the student body. Um, our main event this semester, which I'm incredibly proud of, <laughs> was the Banana Split to Commit event, which is the picture you see there of all of us very excitedly holding signs up. Um, this event was designed to educate people about what the Real Food Challenge was, um, 
what each of the four categories I went over meant and why they're important to a sustainable food system. Um, we ended up getting about 250 people coming through that day and it was a lot of fun. So, um, but through this event, we saw a lot of interns take interest in leadership roles um, where they flourished and they actually continue the internship next semester, which is really exciting. That means we're gonna keep up the same momentum, keep working with the calculator, keep working on this percentage. Um, and keep working on how to source our food more sustainably. Um, and all of our hard work was not for nothing because as of this past semester, the chancellor actually signed on to the commitment, making UMass the largest uh, university on the East Coast to sign on, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're hoping that kind of creates a ripple effect in the Pioneer Valley and beyond. Um, because of the school of UMass's size, if we can pull this off and we can make this commitment happen, then it's encouragement for other schools to do the same. Um, and this could potentially shift millions of dollars away from unsustainable food systems um, into more, more sustainable food systems. And obviously UMass is already well on its way of doing that. So it's great that we can continue this momentum and uh, make this a commitment. So, yeah. And one last thing as well is at the Real Food Challenge, there's no real structure of how it's supposed to be run, and UMass was the first university to kind of do it in this intern internship structure. And we're being pursued by other universities to kind of set up a similar structure, because it's been incredibly successful. And we're definitely incredibly thankful and incredibly lucky that UMass Dining has been so transparent and so supportive and so helpful. It's definitely been a huge part of what has made this whole campaign possible. So yeah. Thank you, Joanna. I'm really impressed with the ways that that momentum that Joanna spoke about really comes from this team effort and all these different players working together. Our last panelist is Ali Kondra from Harvard Law School. Um, they have been working lately to think about policy that affects um, institutional food buying. They published a report maybe a year ago on that, and I think they're working on another one. And I think really Joe gave the perfect introduction to um, a pan panelist who's going to talk about policy and the regulatory environment because he explained, gave a really good example of how that impacts his business and his ability to play this very important role of an aggregator in connecting um, farms and institutions. And I think it, that story also illustrates the way that it's not only how the regulation is written, but how it's enforced because he's talking about a law that's been on the books since 1939 that's suddenly playing a part in his business but didn't used to before. So I'll turn it over to Allie with that. All right, good morning everybody. Um, so you just heard a lot about UMass and UMass's policy and the success that it has had um, out here. And I'm going to take a step back and just talk about policy generally. And I am not actually going to talk specifically about the regulations um, in that way, so if you have any questions afterwards, I would be happy to talk to you about that, but I'm just gonna talk about why policy is important in the context of farm to institution. Um, so this is my only slide, so you have to stare at it for a while and listen to me, <laughs> not the slide. So briefly, a little bit about the food law and policy clinic at Harvard Law School. So, about three years ago, we started a clinic, and the mission of the Food Law and Policy Clinic is to increase access to healthy foods, prevent diet-related diseases such as type 2 diabetes and obesity, and then um, assist small-scale and sustainable farmers in participating in local markets. And so a clinic is kind of a confusing word to use in a law school or a legal setting and what it means is that we have students that come work with us and they get credit for putting into practice what it is that they are learning in school so it's a hands-on time so we can craft little lawyers and then let them out into the world and hopefully <laughs> to do good work um, so we have been working on two projects around farm to institution in Massachusetts over the last two years in the fall we did a project on farm to institution well, farm to um, state colleges and universities, and that report is on our website, so you can um, download it and read it if you'd like. 
And then we have this spring been working on a project about local procurement by state agencies. And so those are two different entities that are purchasing local product, uh, products. And the reason we've been looking at local procurement by state colleges and universities and now by state agencies is because there happens to be a law in Massachusetts that deals with local procurement. So has anybody heard of this section 23B? Okay, so some of you are familiar. Um, in Massachusetts, there is a law that requires state agencies to purchase Massachusetts grown food if it's not more than 10% more expensive than out of state products. And then it encourages state colleges and universities to do the same, but doesn't require it. So there's this policy backdrop in the state that institutions in Massachusetts should buy local produce. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on section 23B, but just keep it in the back of your mind as we move through the rest of the day. Uh, so as Andrew mentioned earlier, there's a lot of talk about the importance of tying food access to supporting local food systems. And farm to institution policies and programs are a really good way of bridging that gap. So farm to institution is important for consumers because it does increase consumers' access to healthy foods. So if you have an institution that is purchasing local products and they consume that food, then they are thereby having more opportunities to eat local healthy food. Farm to institution is also really good for farmers because as we were talking about before, uh, direct sales at farmers markets are great, but it's not always the most secure way of making a livelihood. Uh, but if you have institutions that are purchasing local produce, it's a more secure market. Farmers are able to grow their operation because they have a demand that they can meet. Uh, and third, farm to institution is important because it allows institutions to engage in education and conversation around the importance of healthy food and about supporting local food systems. So if you didn't already have enough reasons to support farm to institution, there are three more that connect food access and supporting local food systems. So I am a lawyer, which means that we like policy, we like to talk about policy and think about policy. And so I was asked to talk about why policy is important in farm to institution. Uh, first, there are two major categories of policy that we think about. There's the government policy, which is what section 23B is. The state says this is what we're going to do. But then there are also policies that can be implemented by non-government institutions, so hospitals and schools and prisons and those other types of institutions that can be separate from a government policy. And so I'm going to focus on the importance of institutions themselves having their own policies. One reason why farm to institution policies are important is because it is a statement of support for local agriculture. So it puts the issue of local food systems and food access on people's radar, because sometimes people have no idea that supporting local food systems is even an issue. We all know that, but people outside of this group may not. So having an institution that says we support local produce or local agriculture in this way is really important. Secondly, having a policy on purchasing local food um, has more staying power than just relying on a program. So a policy is a commitment by an institution to certain behavior and certain actions, and then you figure out in the long run how to maintain that policy. A third reason why farm to institution is important is because it shows that there is increased demand for local produce. Think if all the institutions in your area said, we have a policy of buying local produce, during the summer months or all year, then farmers would say, wow, all these people want local produce. Maybe I should grow my operation so that I can meet that demand. Um, and my fourth, I, I had listed five, but I think really I have four and a half policy reasons. Uh, so the fourth and a little is that when an institution creates its own policy rather than trying to meet maybe the government's policy or the institution decides we want to have this policy, the people who are going to implement the policy 
are the ones that are actually making it, right? So as the people who are designing the policy in the institution, you can say, here's what we want to do, and you can tailor it to your specific institution. And you can set benchmarks that are able to be met and monitored in the way that is appropriate for your own institution, rather than trying to fit somebody else's model. And then that means that you can actually measure the success and hopefully have a policy that is successful because you have crafted it to your own needs. And so we've heard that UMass Amherst has this really great policy and they have been very successful. But as we all know, and we've talked about Congress and we've talked about all our lawmakers, sometimes policies are not as successful as we hope that they would be. And so in our research for our uh, state colleges and universities report and now the state agencies report, we've identified a number of barriers and challenges that institutions have had in purchasing local produce. Uh, and one of the main problems is that people don't know about the law or they don't know about the policy more broadly. Um, and so one thing that institutions that you all can do, this is our next steps and call to arms for increasing policies around farm to institution, is that increasing awareness about the policies that exist, or if you start a new policy, increasing awareness about that is really important. So if you can educate the farmers about the policy, educate the people who are buying the food, um, connect the farmers with the institutional purchasers. We've talked about this Match.com idea, and that's really true and something that this group as a network can certainly do, is to find who's selling and who's buying and connect them together. Another barrier that we have heard about already today is some of the increased requirements to selling to institutions, such as the GAP, so the Good Agricultural Practices, or the Commonwealth Quality Certification. Um, and so one thing that advocates can do to help support policies around farm to institution is to facilitate training, to provide funding, to host a training so that the barriers are reduced around this and will help make the policy more successful. Another barrier that people have identified are just the logistical issues. And so we've, again, heard about this already, but if you have one farmer who's trying to sell to UMass Amherst, the demand is pretty high and the farmer by themselves might not be able to meet that demand. So working with an aggregator or facilitating the development of more aggregators in the area is a way to make a farm to institution policy more successful because you are helping meet the demand. And lastly, the um, last barrier I want to mention is the difficulty of measuring success of your policy. So we all know that change is really hard and if you're adding a new policy, there's going to be some time that it takes to see if your policy is successful. And so what you want to do is make sure that when you institute your policy, that you have a way of measuring the success. So you can say, here's what we've done, and let's keep building on this momentum. Um, and so you can ask the food companies, the food service management companies, to track their local produce purchases. And they may say that they can't do it, but I think that they probably can. You just have to push them a little bit and say, sure you can, everybody can do that. Um, and once you have the information about tracking the local purchases, then you can see if you're accomplishing your goal and then maybe change your policy if you want to set a higher goal in the future. So those are my four reasons or opportunities for increasing policies around farmed institution. And I did want to mention, I think my time is pretty much up, um, but I did want to mention along the lines of regulations and laws and these kinds of big scary things that are coming down, one thing to keep on your radar is that a couple years ago, Congress passed this Food Safety Modernization Act. Can I see a show of hands of people who know about it? So mostly everybody. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act, which significantly overhauled the nation's food safety laws. Uh, and Congress, now FDA, is passing regulations, proposed regulations around that. Um, and a couple just came out in January that are pretty significant for on-farm production and then processing. Uh, and it's a pretty complicated topic and I have negative time now. So if you want to talk more about what this means for farm to institution purchasing for the farmers and then the institutions that are doing the purchasing, 
I would be happy to talk to you about this afterwards. Also, Mary Dale DeVore is supposed to be here, but... She's just not here yet. She's not here yet. Okay, well, when she shows up, um, she also has been working on this topic and would be happy to talk to any of you about it. So, thank you. We're expecting later this summer to do an information session on the Food Safety and Modernization Act uh, for farmers at CESA, so you can watch our website too if you're interested in learning more about it through that route as well as these other valuable channels. So we're going to do about 10 minutes of question and answer and then we're going to have a brief break so that you can go to the bathroom which is down that hall or just stretch or talk to somebody. So questions? Yes. Oh, and Sam's going to run around with the microphone. Um, or yeah. Or yeah. Um, Bessie Johnson from Springfield. What about meat, dairy, poultry? Uh, you know, we had a lot of talk about produce. Is there what's <laughs> happening on other meat, uh, meat, dairy? Chris, do you want to talk yeah, about I, I can, about I protein? Speak, I can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> so, so as you can imagine, we we go through a lot of uh, meat, um, whether it's beef, chicken pork, um, bacon, uh, but it's really difficult to find a local uh, purveyor that can supply us in the demand, in the, the quantities that we need in a price range that's competitive. Um, just for instance, we spend, uh, you know, about uh, 1.5 million with Tyson, um, and it's, we go through a lot of chicken, lots and lots of chicken, and, you know, if, if we could use local chicken, I mean, we'd, we'd love to, but I don't think there's anyone in the valley that can provide us with that, that much. Um, so we're actually, we're, we're taking steps now, now that we're with the food, Real Food Challenge, um, and we're going to challenge Tyson to come up with, with a, a solution um, in terms of uh, being more humane, um, being able to be more sustainable. Um, we don't know if it's possible for them, um, because it's, a, it's, you know, the giant company, so just, you know, turning a little bit is really difficult. Um, but we have to give them the opportunity to see um, if, they, if they can do that. Uh, on a more limited basis, um, we love to use, like for instance, in our catering department, I know that we use a lot of uh, local products. Um, our university club, uh, we've used some local meats, uh, but we, we can do better. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress. It's just, it's really, it's really difficult to, to source that amount of products. And we've, we've looked at it before, um, and just in this, this area, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but you know, we're, we're always looking for new sources, uh, new ways to do things. Um, as you can, can imagine, we're very committed to uh, local procurement. Um, so if you have any suggestions, our ears are open. Um, we'd love to meet with you. Um, you know, the, the future's bright. And, uh, you know, as, as is, is, you know, we've seen with the Real Food Challenge, UMass is taking a leadership role and being the, first, the largest university to take, the, take on that challenge. So, you know, although it seems like it may be insurmountable, you know, we're, we're definitely there to see if we can make, you know, meet that demand uh, using either a local or a regional uh, grower. Um, so, you know, if you have, uh, have any suggestions you'd like to meet, you know, I'm sure that Ken would love to sit down with, with yourselves um, or with me and we can discuss further. Thanks. I think Chris is right that um, meat is a place where Kelly's um, point about regional sourcing makes a lot of sense. And there is a project that a number of state departments of Agri New England State Departments of Agriculture are working on, led by um, Vermont, to look at the potential for using dairy cull cows um, to supply beef to institutions. Um, and that obviously is a is a good Vermont solution where there's lots of dairy cows. So. Uh, I'm Ana Jaramillo and I have a question for Chris. And usually we talk in farm to institution about who is growing and who is buying. But I think something that maybe Chris can explain is uh, who is cooking it. Because something that is happening, and I know and I have been witnesses, the change that make farm to institution different here at UMass is the role of the chefs. And I just want you to talk a little bit, because we can buy fresh, but doesn't mean it's easy to cook, and how these changes need to happen in the institution to make chefs attractive to use more fresh products, because increase the amount of cooking, and increase the equipment, increase the timing, and that happened here and could be done anywhere. But I think if Chris can talk a little bit more, it will be important. 
So yeah, I can I can kind of touch upon that a little bit. So um, obviously uh, I'm not doing the cooking, which is probably a good thing. Um, but we do we do have a, a, a large uh, local base of chefs that work in, uh, in, within our department. They know they work they lived in the valley for years, so they they know where everything's grown and, and how to prepare it. But one of the great things that, that Joe provides is a, a value added product. So for instance, uh, butternut squash. You know, I'm, not, I'm sure you're all familiar with how hard it is to peel a butternut squash. Uh, well, he, he provides it peeled for us, um, even, you know, diced up if, if we want it. Uh, same thing with uh, carrot sticks, peeled uh, large bags. Uh, so he, he takes some of the labor out, which is, you know, very attractive because, as you know, labor is, is you know, costs a lot of money. I'm trying to figure out what, what the, the negatives were with, uh, with purchasing local, even though if it was um, a, little, a little less processed. Um. Hi, I'm Kathy Zija from Smith College, and I could maybe comment a little bit more, Chris, because I know you're more on the buying end. I'm the director of dining. And I think some of the challenges that our staff have, if we didn't have Joe processing the vegetable, the squashes, is um, ergonomic. There's carpal tunnel and things like that. The yield sometimes from lettuces vary greatly. Um, and so our staff sometimes will complain because they've got to do more chopping. Um, and there's less waste. Training is very important. It does need to be treated differently uh, when it is fresh and to get that yield. Um, you know, sometimes staff are used to lopping off a pepper and they're throwing out a quarter of the pepper when they're preparing it. So I think it's a very important point that she made and I just thought I would ride a little on your coattail. Sure. Just Can a I comment to share some of the experiences that our staff have had. Sure, and I just want to kind of, uh, kind of go off uh, that comment a little bit. So we, we have a program called Lean Path. Um, and it's actually it's for, for everything that we use, not just local products, but it measures how much waste is, is in post-production and pre-production. Um, and it puts a dollar value on that. So it makes cooks accountable to how much they actually throw away. Um, and, and, you know, it has their name and how much money that particular amount that they just, you know, composted. Um, so it, it shows a dollar figure where sometimes if you don't know how much something costs, like if you're in the kitchen, if you're just a regular line chef, you may not know you know, how much that, you know, 50 pounds of, of, of waste you just um, composted was. So this program actually puts the dollar figure, makes people more accountable. And then our managers, you know, bring this data to the particular person or group that is doing the, you know, the preparation saying, look, you know, what, what's going on here? Why did we, you know, compost 200 more pounds of potatoes this week, even though the, the count was down? Um, so that's just another way that, that we can, um, as, you, know, you talked about training sites, so that's sort of a, a training metrics that we use. Kelly Irwin has done quite a lot of training with food service staff too, so she's another resource if you want to talk more about that. And one more, okay. Hi, I'm Laura Porter with Holy Food and Fitness, and I have a question for Joe. Um, if you could just talk a little bit more about what what it means to be an aggregator and how far afield you're getting contributions to your aggreg aggregation center, and then uh, in reference to that processing that you do. Who is doing that processing, that value-added um, peeling, the butternut squash or the carrots? Is that machinery? And um, just talk a little bit more. And, and I guess also about the liability. If you're bringing in produce from other farms, are you assuming liability for all of those other farms? Whether, I mean, if they don't have GAP certification or how do those things work within your system? Okay. Um, our, our list in the fall of local items would be about 30 items long. Um, we raise most of them on our farm. We, we don't raise apples, for instance. We don't raise potatoes. Those are kind of specialized things. We need a lot of different equipment, expensive equipment. Um, so we, we do bring in some of the items from other farmers. We, there's a, a lot of good farmers in the area. We, we, we actually go to their farm so we see what kind of operation they run and how clean it is and how they manage things. We, we often work with them, um, swapping land back and forth for rotational needs. There, there are a, an awful lot of good farmers in this valley. This valley has a history of tobacco, and tobacco farmers uh, were, were trained to put out a quality product. What they were selling was art. I mean, it was texture, quality, all that stuff. So these are really good, good farmers that we work with. Um, as far as the processing goes or the food prep, it's min minimally processed. Like, we'll make carrot sticks, or we'll do peeled butternut squash or snip beans. We stay away from the lettuces and things like that just because um, I don't feel that I can guarantee a safe product in those things. I, I like to specialize in items that can cook because there is a level of safety in that 
For instance, the ad item we're adding this year is Brussels sprouts, bringing in a harvester from, from Brussels, where they probably call them sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> so th those are the kind of things we do. It's our, our own people um, do, the, do the food prep, and it seems to fit together nicely because I can offer my people year-round employment, whereas if I was just seasonal, I'd have to lay them off, and I don't think that's what they or their families want. Josh, you wanted to know if you use machinery for the processing. Yeah, we have some nice stuff. Um, we we buy our uh, most of the machinery is, is is all we we buy only from manufacturers that make a lot. We tried buying from somebody who made just specialized stuff, but I wouldn't buy a car from somebody who only made four. Um, we do make our own squash peeling machines, and I think we have some of the best in the world. Um, we peel a lot of squash, over a million pounds a year. I have an idea what's in the next one. Um, but most of the machines, like the carrot peelers and the slicers, they're either Urschel or Lyco or somebody like that. It's all, all stainless, all quality stuff. And we, uh, we do train our people. We do carry the proper insurances. And we do handle products from other farmers. But once again, because I am assuming the liability, I, I, it's usually products like potatoes that I know people are going to cook. I, I try to be very careful. I believe you can get poor in this business faster you can get rich. So uh, we, we try to be pretty careful when it comes to food safety and liability. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists again. They were great. And most of them are sticking around. So if you have additional questions, please come find them and ask your questions. And we're going to have a brief break, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from each of the other projects that are here to as resource people.